Wallace Reed began making films in Hollywood in 1910, and continued throughout the rest of that decade, even making an appearance in D.W. Griffith's infamous film Birth of a Nation in 1915, sharing the screen with Robert Herron, another ill-fated actor. Reed became a leading figure in the movie star worship of the early 1920s. He was handsome, romantic, and masculine, a big hit among women. He is sometimes considered to be the most popular male screen idol before Rudolph Valentino hit the scene. But with this kind of popularity, there would be a cost, and Reed would eventually pay with his life. In 1919, Reed was making a film with Paramount Studios called The Valley of the Giants. While on the way to the filming location, he was seriously injured in a train accident. He was given morphine to ease the pain, and the filming proceeded. At the time, this was a common treatment, especially in Hollywood. The problem was, with morphine, like some other drugs, a person eventually acclimated to it, which meant that it required a higher dosage to feel as effective as before. It didn't take long before Wallace Reed was completely addicted to morphine, and was reliant on it to be anywhere near useful for making movies, and his health was quickly becoming a problem. It started to affect his personality too. The normally easygoing Reed became irritable, and sometimes behaved erratically. To help ease his frustration, he also started drinking more. The studio eventually cut him off from morphine, but he easily got more on the black market. Not only was he addicted, but this was Hollywood. A long break from movies could mean the end of his career, and the pressure of the environment of the movie industry must have been immense. And if he did receive a lengthy recovery time, people would probably prod into the matter, and possibly uncover the truth something that had the potential to further damage Hollywood's reputation after the Fatty Arbuckle scandal in 1921. Despite his worsening condition, he was pushed to keep up his busy schedule. He lost a lot of weight and had outbursts of anger. By December 1922, he had lost 60 pounds since his injuries, and was too weak to do any more filming. His wife, actress Dorothy Davenport, finally persuaded him to go to a Hollywood sanitarium that month, but it was too late. He slipped in and out of comas, his immune system too weak to fight off infections. On January 18, 1923, he died from complications of pneumonia at the young age of 31. Dorothy wrote to her mother-in-law, The boy simply slept away, died at 1 o'clock today. Our hearts are together. Reed's last feature film, titled 30 Days, is lost, but it was not a success. His bad physical condition was apparently obvious to many theater goers. Ironically, the last movies where Wallace Reed made an appearance were two films that sought to convince the public that Hollywood was a great place, featuring his and other cameos from many actors and actresses. Perhaps it was seen that way by some, but it was also the same place that indirectly killed Wallace Reed. After his death as a tribute to him, his wife began billing herself as Mrs. Wallace Reed, and turned him into a symbol of the fight against drug addiction. She made a film about this exact topic later that same year. However, neither she nor the media ever pushed the fact that the ruthless Hollywood system was a major contributing factor to his death. Without the crazy schedules and added stress, not to mention his enabled morphine dependency, he might have kicked his addiction, or wouldn't have had it in the first place. But in the immediate aftermath of his death, Hollywood's role was officially swept under the rug. In the same year of his death, Reed's mother published a short book about his life. In the book, his last months were summed up in the form of letters written to her by his wife, Dorothy, from the sanitarium. A letter from December 10th, 1922 stated that, Poor Wally had a relapse, and he can't go to work for two or three weeks yet, 
but we hope all will be well in a few days. Then, in another letter from December 31st, Wally is improving every day, and he hopes to be back at work in six weeks. In hindsight, it's a little disturbing how much emphasis was placed on him getting back to work, even in his final languishing months. The letters also talked about how he looked much younger and healthier, which couldn't possibly have been true of a man less than a month away from dying of drug addiction and illness. The book didn't directly mention drug addiction, or his hectic work schedule. It focused more on his likable personality, though sometimes vaguely mentioned certain rumors about him that the reader is apparently already supposed to know about. And this was how he was remembered for many years, a victim of drug addiction, but not of Hollywood. But we know now that, without Hollywood's role in all of this, he might have never gone down that path to destruction. This next death involved another famous Hollywood person, and is one of the most famous and mysterious Hollywood deaths of all time. By the 1920s, Thomas H. Ince was a very successful actor-turned-producer. He had set up a vast studio lot named Inceville in Santa Monica, California, pioneering such practices as storyboard writing prior to filming, film budgeting, and calculating how long it would take to finish a film. He also pioneered the Western as a film genre, and helped to propel Mary Pickford to nationwide fame. But by the early 1920s, Hollywood was changing very quickly. This period saw the beginning of the rise of big studios that were soon to dominate the film industry, and were trying to push smaller studios, like Ince's, out of the picture or buy them out. To try and get around this, Ince sought to befriend William Randolph Hearst, the controversial but very powerful newspaper tycoon. On November 15, 1924, Hearst invited Ince, along with other Hollywood luminaries such as Charlie Chaplin, Eleanor Glynn, Luella Parsons, and Hearst's own mistress, Marion Davies, to a trip to San Diego on Hearst's yacht, Oneida. Ince's 44th birthday was the next day, the 16th, which was used as the excuse for the excursion. The details of what happened aboard the yacht that day are still very cloudy, and made more difficult by various rumors and speculation over the years. What we do know is that Ince became very sick on the second night of the trip, so the yacht stopped at San Diego, where Ince was taken ashore to a hotel, and eventually back to his home in Beverly Hills, where he died shortly after, on November 19th. The details published about the incident varied widely. The location of his death, the cause of death, and exactly who witnessed what were all at odds with each other in different accounts. For example, Charlie Chaplin's secretary allegedly saw a bullet wound on Ince's head as he was being taken off the boat. This supported a common rumor that Hearst was trying to shoot at Charlie Chaplin, but hit Ince by accident. This was because Hearst's mistress, Marion Davies, was allegedly Chaplin's mistress as well. Some even thought that the yacht trip was a trap, and that Hearst wanted to catch Davies and Chaplin fooling around together. Then there was the fact that Ince died on November 19th, and his body was quickly cremated on the 21st. Cremation was in accordance with his wishes, but because it was done so soon after his death under suspicious circumstances, it only fueled rumors. It was also rumored that Hearst gave some of the witnesses, including his own wife, bribes so they wouldn't discuss what had happened. But again, it was just a rumor. A less sensational explanation for the cause of Ince's death was a stomach ulcer. A stomach ulcer can have symptoms very similar to those of angina, or even a heart attack. So if the attending doctor was unaware that Ince had an ulcer, it could have easily been a simple misdiagnosis when he listed the cause of death as heart failure. 
but there are reasons why some have an alternative explanation for the misdiagnosis. Like any Hollywood party before, during, and after Prohibition, there was a lot of alcohol. With the crackdown of censorship in Hollywood, all of these celebrities being involved in illegal activities would have been something they wouldn't want to get out. And ulcers were sometimes linked with heavy drinking, so Hearst and Company might have wanted to avoid that connection at all costs. This could account for why the witnesses' details often didn't match. Luella Parsons even claimed that she not only wasn't on the boat, but that she was across the country in New York. This was later disproven. Marion Davies claimed that there was no alcohol on the boat that night. That was also disproven. Interestingly, Davies corroborated Luella Parsons' claim that she wasn't on the boat. She also said that Chaplin wasn't there either. But yes, that was also disproven. But the fact that some of these accounts, like Davies, were from long after Prohibition ended is more than a little puzzling if they were trying to cover up the drinking. The lack of definite facts is frustrating, and because of how much time has passed, there will probably not be any more shocking revelations that have any real effect on the case. So, we will probably never get a definite answer about how Thomas H. Ince died, but it was most likely an ulcer or another natural cause. And, unfortunately, he is more remembered for his death than for his contributions to the American film industry. Max Linder is a relatively forgotten celebrity today, but he was one of the biggest stars of early film. He was born in Saint-Loubès in southwestern France on December 16, 1883. His family was well off, having a successful vineyard. Instead of taking over the family business, as a young man, he went to study acting. In the first half of the 1900s, he found work in small bit parts, usually comedies. He continued appearing in various early shorts for Pathé, eventually taking up the persona of a rich, debonair gentleman named Max. This persona was an influence on Charlie Chaplin, who had not yet begun making films. By 1910, Max Linder was a big star in the burgeoning film world, becoming arguably the first real movie star. At that time, France was still the capital of film, and that meant that Linder's films were being sent off to other countries, making him an international success. The next few years saw the peak of his career, but then came World War I. He was deemed unfit for combat when he tried to enlist, but he was allowed to be a driver, though the extent of his military experience is not clear. According to records, he had three separate illnesses just within the span of the first year of the war alone. Speculation about his military service range from him never leaving the barracks to the oft-repeated story that he took a bullet to the lung. One unconfirmed story from a supposed comrade states that he had made at least one trip from Paris to the front lines. However, regardless of what happened during his service, he was soon abruptly dismissed from duty, though the reasons for that were never explicitly stated. It's likely that it was due to health problems. From then on, he served as an entertainer for French soldiers. It was around this time that he first experienced depression, at least as far as is known. Though there was a rumor during his tour in Moscow before the war that he was gloomy and not friendly if a fan met him on the street. The reasons for his depression are not entirely clear, but the global conflict that was ripping his country apart and killing so many of his fellow countrymen probably wasn't helping matters. He was known to speak of the violence and terror of combat, which, as I mentioned before, he may or may not have actually witnessed. If he had, that might have played a large part. As with quite a few screen stars in later years, some events in Linder's life might have been exaggerated or entirely made up, 
by himself or by others. But one can't help but think that lying about war experiences, especially at that time, would have been in very bad taste and would have been a very risky career move. Linder moved to the United States to try his hand at making movies there, and stayed until the summer of 1918. His films with SNA Studios weren't too successful, though he had befriended Charlie Chaplin while he was there. Linder went back to Paris, made one more film there, and eventually moved back to the US a few years later, in 1921. But ultimately, he moved back to France in the summer of 1922. In an interview in the months before leaving, he was quoted as saying something that went under the radar at the time. He said, I exercise how to be cheerful and happy every morning. I sing loudly, I whistle, I dance, and I'm sad, sad infinitely. The films he made in America were quite good and were moderate successes at the box office but not nearly enough to regain his popularity from the pre-war years. After he returned to Europe, he made two more films, the last being filmed in Austria. By this time, it was becoming obvious that something was wrong with Linder. His depression had taken a turn for the worse, making it difficult for him to perform. On August 2nd, 1923, he married Elaine Peters, usually called Nanette, who was 20 years younger than him, being only 17 when their relationship was first discovered earlier that same year. Nanette's mother actually accused Linder of kidnapping her underage daughter when they went off to Nice together. Nanette was also the heiress to her father's restaurant fortune, so together she and Linder were quite wealthy. You might think that a beautiful, young new wife and more money would help him feel better, but it was said that Linder didn't look very happy at the wedding, and a rumor circulated that he had been forced into it for some reason. A mere six months later, on February 24th, 1924, Linder and Nanette were found unconscious in their hotel room in Vienna, Austria, both under the influence of Veronal a barbiturate commonly used as a sleep aid at the time. This was publicly declared an accidental overdose. Linder claimed he had been taking Veronal habitually at night so he could fall asleep, and had developed a tolerance to it. Less than a week later, Linder went back to filming his latest and last film, which was the reason why they were in Austria in the first place. To make this whole situation worse, Nanette had been pregnant at the time of the near-death experience, because in June 1924, their daughter Maud was born, but she was a healthy baby. Just to clarify, Linder's bad mood at the wedding couldn't have been related to the pregnancy, because there were 10 months between the wedding and the birth of Maud. While the birth of their daughter should have been good news for the couple, it probably only added more stress to their relationship, and it was becoming more and more obvious, especially to Nanette, that Linder was not just depressed, but very mentally disturbed. This had been foreshadowed earlier when Linder had agreed to an interview with a man from a British film magazine. Everything was going fine until Linder was asked about his impending marriage. Instead of answering, he stood up, took out a revolver from a drawer, and slowly started loading it up with a few bullets. The interviewer was so disturbed by these strange actions that he quickly left. Shortly before Maud was born, Linder was working with the famed director Abel Gantz, who a few years later would make his greatest masterpiece, Napoleon. Together, they made a short titled U Secur, which would be released in June 1924. The box office performance was underwhelming, and the critics were critical. According to a New York Times article, Linder began making dark comments to friends, saying things like he had nothing left to live for. After he bought a revolver, his friends took it away from him, fearing what he might do with it, to which he replied that he knew a better way than that. 
In late October 1925, Linder and Nanette reportedly went to see the film Quo Vadis, in which two characters, Petronius and Eunice, commit suicide by bleeding themselves to death. Things started to get even worse with Linder, and Nanette wrote to her mother only days later, He will kill me. Linder abruptly resigned as president of the French Society of Film Authors after only holding the position for three months. Then, when visiting a friend, he told him it would be their last meeting. Even with all of these obvious hints and implications, it seems that nobody was willing to do anything drastic to intervene. On the morning of November 1st, Mrs. Peters, Nanette's mother, having been told that Linder and her daughter were planning a trip to the countryside and wanting to wish them safe travels, called Linder's hotel room, but there was no answer. A porter informed her that Linder had forbidden all calls. Mrs. Peters went up to the room herself, and hotel staff forced the door open, and they discovered Linder and Nanette unconscious, bleeding profusely on their bed, though still alive. They were quickly rushed to a hospital, but Nanette died seven hours later, and Linder also died afterwards. The deaths were reported as part of a suicide pact, and that was the official cause decided upon, but the details remain unconfirmed. Nanette's family did not believe that the young woman had wanted to die as Linder had. Though if that was true, one might wonder why she hadn't screamed for help. The most likely theory for this is that Nanette, resigned to her husband's determination for them to die together, eventually agreed to drink a sleeping potion that knocked her out so that she wouldn't feel any pain. Both had been injected with morphine and had drunk Veronal, the same drug they had used previously. But the extent to which Linder coerced Nanette into his fantasy of death, if he did, is unknown. Though, according to the testimony of Nanette's doctor, Linder was extremely emotionally abusive towards her, and she was convinced that he would kill her. This suggests that under normal circumstances, she never would have willingly gone along with such an act. She probably felt like she had no way out, so she just accepted it. The whole story of Max Linder's decline is confusing and complicated, filled with rumors and sketchy details. Perhaps his mental decline was due to something horrific he experienced during the war. Or perhaps it was caused by his declining career and his inability to regain the stardom that he once had, despite still being held in high regard. Or perhaps it was due to some personal flaw that led to viciousness. We will never know for certain. And then there was also their daughter Maud, who was less than two years old when they died. She went on to write extensively about her father's life and fairly successfully revived his legacy in film, at least in France, and died in 2017 at the age of 93. Unfortunately, Max Linder's morbid end overshadows much of what he accomplished in his career and his contributions to the film industry. It's a shame that such a talent had to go down such a dark path and drag his wife down with him. I hadn't originally planned to redo parts 4 and 5, but I recently decided to go for it. This remake was a full re-edit from scratch, complete with new updated recordings and an edited script. Part 5 will be the same, and it will be uploaded later this month. But that's all for now all you sheiks and gals out there, but stay tuned for more Tales from the Jazz Age. <laughs>